You are listening to the podcast of the Maciasz Korvinas Collegium, the largest talent management institute in Hungary. If you want to know more about our mission, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or check out our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter channels. For interesting articles and analysis of our professors, external contributors, and students, look up our knowledge base at korvinak.hu slash en. So very warm, warm welcome um, to our audience today. My name is Richard Schenk. I am a visiting fellow at MCC at the German Hungarian Institute. And I'm also a research associate at the Technical University of Munich. Uh, my guest today is Professor Dr. André Tess, who is a professor of energy storage at the University of, of, of Stuttgart. Um, he, he studied physics at the Technical Uni University of, Tre uh, of Dresden. Uh, where he also got his doctorate at the Helmholtz, Helmholtz Center of Dresden Rosendorf in uh, 1991 with distinction. And um, previously to his position in Stuttgart, he served as a professor of technical thermodynamics at the Technical University of Ilmenau from 1998 to 2014. And um, yeah, the main reason why we invited you to this podcast It's because you st started a very interesting public debate on, on the energy trans transition towards renewables and on nuclear energy in, in Germany. So I want to ask you, is, this, is the phrase, follow the science, that, is recently, uh, that recently came up during the climate protests, um, actually true. Are we following the science when, when it comes down to energy transition? As a scientist, I believe that science is very important. But at the same time, I believe that the slogan follow the science is very misleading. Why? Uh, there is no question that smoking is harmful. But whether smoking should be banned in office rooms or wherever... It's not a scientific matter, it's a political matter. And in a similar way, I believe that the scientific uh, knowledge about climate change, about energy, is very important. But from this scientific knowledge, it does not automatically follow what we have to do. And I believe that uh, political decisions should be based on science. But I don't like the motto, follow the science, because it is misleading, as I think. We will not only talk about Germany, but let's begin with, with the debate that you started in Germany. Um, you are among the 19 uh, distinguished uh, academics on the, in the fields of and energy um, who, who issued the so-called Stuttgart Declaration. And before we, we speak about this declaration for our international audience, just a short recap on the current state of uh, German energy policy. Historically, Germany uh, strongly relied on coal and lignite, which is also called brown coal. And then after the Second World War, nuclear energy has been introduced to complement coal. But in 1986, the Chernobyl disaster um, served as a starting point for a very strong anti-nuclear movement in Germany. And uh, they were all successful because in 2000, The, the back then, the Social Democrat and Green government under, under Chancellor Schröder signed uh, Germany's withdrawal from nuclear into, into law, um, which has been reversed shortly in 2010 by the Merkel government. Uh, um, the, the Merkel government re-extended the life of nuclear power plants. But only one year later, in 2011, another nuclear accident happened in Fukushima this time. And Chancellor Merkel dropped nuclear um, energy overnight and de declared the transition to renewables as the main policy goal. So Germany has a very back and forth relation to nuclear. And right now, the current state is that we are leaving nuclear energy completely by the end of, the, uh, end of uh, this year. Um, but you, um, last year, in the summer of last year, issued this Stuttgart Declaration which petitioned the German parliament, the Bundestag, that the complete withdrawal from the nuclear uh, is, is, a, um, is not, not a good idea. And instead, we should rely on nuclear again for, for 
because it's climate friendly um, and uh, we need to complement it uh, uh, to complement solar and wind power. That's correct, right? In the declaration, you see you say that Germany has a one-sided reliance, uh, reliance on solar, wind, and gas as a result of the 10 years of the energy transition. Why one-sided? Are these three sources of energy not very different in nature? Uh, when we talk about a one-sided approach to the energy policy, uh, we mean that um, uh, Germany has decided to pull out of coal and to pull out of nuclear energy. And Germany has also decided to put its energy future on three pillars, wind, sun, and gas, mostly from Russia, at least before the 24th of uh, February 2022. And uh, our criticism uh, relies on the fact that it is very risky uh, to put your energy strategy on wind, sun, and gas, because it was, was known already before the 24th of February 2022 that the gas supply relies heavily on Russian gas. So uh, looking back, we criticize that it is uh, not a good idea to pull out of nuclear and coal at the same time, and it's neither a good idea to rely your energy policy on wind, sun, and gas. So these are the two points of criticism. And I have also to say that I include myself and the energy community into this criticism because most of the scientists, including myself, have uh, believed in reliance on wind, sun, and gas, but now we understand that it is too risky to pull out of coal and nuclear at the same time. So you say that um, even though wind, solar, and gas are like 100% on, 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 on paper um, of the energy demand that Germany needs, or energy supply that uh, Germany needs, but we need to have uh, different sources of energy as well to to counterbalance the, the problems each um, energy source has. Absolutely. We have to, we have to in order to understand um, the properties that our energy supply needs to have, uh, it is sometimes useful to look at a completely different field of engineering, namely uh, uh, aerospace engineering. If you have an aircraft and you want the aircraft to carry 300 passengers in a safe way, you need a reliable supply of energy and also you need something that is called redundance. So why do you need two gas turbines? You need two gas turbines because the airplane has, the airplane has to arrive at its destination even if one of these uh, two engines would fail. And this redundancy is something that you also need in an energy system. And if you rely only on an energy system consisting of wind, sun and gas, it's like an airplane relying on only one single engine. And you, as, uh, you need another engine in order to have a redundant, safe, and uh, reliable energy supply. And in this respect, it's sometimes useful to learn from aeronautics and astronautics in order to understand what has to be done in order to provide a safe and reliable energy system. Yeah, very interesting that you mentioned aerospace industry because one of the big manufacturers of airplanes had a major issue in the recent years with uh, not enough real, uh, redundancy in its plates. But let, let's not divert from, from nuclear. Um, you also criticized that the withdrawal from nuclear leads to rising energy prices, both for households and for uh, industry. But I, I'm, I'm, I'm also working in Germany and I very often I hear on uh, in all kinds of talking on, and uh, about energy, that renewables are much cheaper, especially after the initial investments, because sun and wind are basically for free, and uranium, uranium is not. What um, what are you thinking about this uh, this argument? I'm a professor of energy storage, and I can tell you that it is not correct to compare the cost of one kilowatt hour of solar energy with one kilowatt hour of, let's say, nuclear energy, because solar energy is fluctuating and 
nuclear energy is a uh, baseload energy form. So in order to compare the costs, you have to compare solar energy with a battery to nuclear energy. And as an expert in energy storage, I can tell you, even though solar energy in itself may be cheaper than coal or nuclear, but if you couple solar energy to any kind of storage, be it battery, be it heat storage, be it hydrogen, the cost of this combination of renewable and storage is way beyond, way beyond coal and nuclear. I would be very happy, and I'm working day and night to change that, to bring the cost of storage and of renewable electricity down. But uh, at the moment, uh, it is a scientific fact that the combination of renewable plus storage is way more expensive than coal and nuclear. Yeah, and at this point of the debate, I often read in, in all kinds of research papers that the big game changer is the dig digitalization of the energy systems or smart grids of any sort. Um, can these two things help with the dimension problem? Uh, I believe that digitalization is, 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 is important in order to raise our productivity. But I do not believe that digitalization is a game changer in in the energy supply in the same way as I do not believe that digitalization is a game changer in the construction of airplanes. If you have an airplane, you need two engines or maybe four engines and you need maybe 10 or 20 megawatts of power and there will be no possibility that digitalization will bring down this power from 10 megawatt to 5 megawatt. And in the same way, if you want to power an industrialized country like Germany, you need a reliable power supply in the amount of 60 to 70 gigawatt baseload electricity, uh, dispatchable electricity, not fluctuating electricity. And in providing this uh, amount of dispatchable electricity, uh, digitalization will may be helpful, but it is not crucial. So I do not believe that this correct that digitalization will be a key of the energy transition. I don't think so. There's also the argument that renewables are enhancing our energy autonomy and therefore they are uh, contributing to, to uh, an energy supply reliability. I mean, gas is coming from Russia, all from the Middle East, uh, etc. Uh, can renewables really enhance our energy, energy autonomy? I do not believe that autonomy is a very important property. Uh, if autonomy of an economy would be key for economic success, then North Korea would be the most economically successful country in the world, which is not the case. I believe that it is important uh, to have international collaboration, including international trade. For this, you need peaceful relations between different nations. And if you have these peaceful relations, then there is no reason uh, to think that an autonomous supply of energy is important in the same way as Germany has no autonomous supply with banana or smartphones or computers. So I believe that autonomy uh, may be a relevant issue, but it's not the most important one. The most important one is global peace, global trade, global collaboration. And if you have that, including trade, then the energy problem is just a question of supply and demand. And the uh, supply of energy needs to be cheap, it needs to be reliable, it needs to be carbon-free. But I do not think that autonomy is a very important issue. Yeah, so the conclusion of your Stuttgart Declaration is nuclear energy should be pursued in the future as well as a complementary energy source to the, to the renewables. And you petitioned uh, this also to the federal parliament, as I mentioned. And the hear hearings... Um, of, of this petition were in November. Can you shortly describe the reaction of your uh, reaction you received? Um, we got very favorable reactions uh, from colleagues, from the general public, and also from the industry. We got very little of criticism. At least we didn't get criticism directly. We got almost no attention from the German public TV and radio, which was very disappointing to us because it is a question of national importance. 
but we were pleasantly surprised that uh, we got almost 60,000 votes for our petition and we got many emails uh, supporting our work and requesting us to continue uh, to keep this uh, topic in the public debate. And that was very good for us. Yeah, nice to hear that uh, um, at least some some uh, support and uh, is there and uh, that also that uh, the, the discussion is uh, um, moving forward a bit. Yeah. Um, also, just, just to be, uh, to, just for the international audiences, um, the Germans uh, had have a very bipolar, um, bipolar uh, attitude to a nuclear energy. So recent polls are showing uh, support for nuclear energy uh, once once again. But uh, let's see how this uh, the, the public debate um, will uh, will develop. But let's move away from the from the declaration and let's um, speak a bit more in general about nuclear energy. Um, are nuclear power plants not dangerous? I mean, Chernobyl, Fukushima, Three Mile Island, these are dangerous incidents. These were dangerous incidents, right? It is important to put the notion of danger on a solid scientific basis. And the basis is the following. If you produce one terawatt hour of electricity, then there is a scientific consensus that this one terawatt hour of electricity entails 25 casualties, 25 deaths of people if it is produced by coal. And it entails 0.1 casualties if the same amount of electricity is produced from wind, from sun, and from nuclear. That means By far the most dangerous energy production technology is the combustion of coal. And the danger of nuclear, wind and sun, including all the casualties of Chernobyl and so on, there is no difference between nuclear, uh, wind and sun. And if you uh, base your uh, judgment on these data, and these are scientific data published by the website Our World in Data that is run by scientists, then it tells you that uh, the most dangerous energy source is coal and nuclear, wind and sun are playing in the same field. This is what the science has to tell you about that. Yeah. Once I read that the German coal power plants are producing more nuclear waste than the nuclear power plants, is this true? I do not know the exact amount of <clears throat> nuclear waste from coal-fired power plants, but the main reason why coal power plants are producing these 25 casualties per, per terawatt hour is th that the, the particle emission from the combustion is harmful for the human health, for the lung. And uh, this is the main reason why coal-fired coal power plants Uh, will have to be uh, uh, phased out over the coming hundred years. And it's not so much the radioactive waste. But, but uh, what, what's a curiosity about the German energy transition is that not coal is the big beneficiary, but lignite, brown coal. Um, and this uh, regarding the, danger, uh, the dangers of uh, energy source, I think lignite is even more dangerous than uh, uh, coal itself. The pollution and the CO2 emission uh, is higher for lignite than for uh, the other coal. And for this reason, uh, you are right that both from an environmental perspective and also from the perspective of CO2 emission, climate change, uh, the actual development, I believe, uh, is not a good one. Um, but how should we get rid of the nuclear waste? There are many technologies um, that already exist of how you can handle nuclear waste. Uh, first, we should understand that the quantity of nuclear waste is big, but is not as big as many people believe. Um, the nuclear waste that has been accumulated worldwide for the whole period of uh, civil application of nuclear energy fits on one football field 
and is about 20 meters high. That's the nuclear waste of the whole world for more than 50 years. One football field, 20 meters high. It's not a small amount, but it's not an amount that cannot be managed. And now you have to see that there are two alternatives. You can either try to bury this nuclear waste for a very, very long time. Some people talk about a million years, but this is not without alternative. An alternative would be uh, to store this radioactive waste for a couple of hundred years, 300 years, 500 years, 600 years, in a building. And after these couple of hundred years, the radioactivity of this waste will have decayed so much that it does not present uh, a bigger danger than other waste that, the, uh, that uh, people present. So the two alternatives are very long time uh, waste management and waste management over a couple of hundred years. And I believe it is a big mistake uh, to not to discuss both opportunities and all, only to discuss what the German call Endlagerung. Um, but are we not just postponing the problem with, with nuclear energy? Because uranium is also a fossil fuel and uh, therefore limited in supply. Isn't it better if we just skip over the, the nuclear phase and directly go to the renewables if we are going to rely on them on the long term anyway? I would very much like to see a world where the combination of renewable energy and energy storage provides cheaper electricity than coal and nuclear. And I'm working day and night, as I told you already, but I do not see this future. So I believe for a very long time we will have to work with uh, a combination of renewables and nuclear energy and geothermal and maybe even fossil fuels with uh, carbon capture and storage. And at this, at this point I would like to refer to the reports of the International Panel of Climate Change. All these reports consistently name the following CO2 free energy sources, wind, sun, nuclear, geothermal, and fossil fuels with CCS. And we should, uh, we should pick from, these, from this portfolio uh, the combination which gives us an economically viable uh, energy mix. And as much as I would like to have an energy supply with minimal environmental impact, as much do I believe that we need this mixture of wind, sun, and nuclear energy. And by the way, a nuclear uh, fuel is abundant if you uh, include the step of reprocessing nuclear waste, which is currently not allowed in Germany. But if we would reprocess nuclear waste, the amount or the range of nuclear fuel would be several hundred, if not thousand years. And it, is, uh, it would not be a problem to have sufficient amounts of nuclear fuel. We already talked about the fact that about the, the, the fact that renewables are very hard to store and therefore not as cheap as they seem to be. But on the other hand, nuclear energy isn't uh, is not for uh, for free either. And very often people say that building new nuclear power plants is super expensive, uh, even in, in affordable. Um, what can you counter? Uh, what, what are you thinking about this this argument? The construction cost of nuclear power plants have been extensively studied. For instance, in, <clears throat> in a study by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with the name The Future of Nuclear Power. And this is, a, this is a study that lists the construction costs of nuclear power plants. And then you can divide these construction costs uh, by 30 years or 40 years. And if you do that, uh, and if you if you if you put in the real costs, the costs that have been actually, the budgets that have been actually spent, and you divide them by the number of years or you divide them by the number of kilowatt hours, you come to the conclusion that even if the construction costs are as high as 10,000 euro per installed kilowatt, even then nuclear power is cheap in the range of 4 cent, 5 cent per kilowatt hour dispatchable electricity. So this 
um, claim that nuclear energy is expensive is not true, in my opinion. Um, yeah, let's talk a bit about the in, uh, international perspective because I mentioned that Germany has a very uh, interesting standpoint on nuclear energy, but uh, today I read uh, the newspaper and France was complaining about the fact that the German government is obstructing um, green hydrogen, as the French see, because they want to produce hydrogen from uh, by using nuclear energy from the uh, nuclear power plants. And the German government is obstructing this, this on the European level. And you were also visiting professor in Lyon and Grenoble. And maybe you can give us some insights on the French perspective on nuclear energy as well. The French perspective for nuclear energy is that uh, France, uh, as a country that does not have significant resources of fossil fuel, uh, has decided a couple of uh, dozen years ago that uh, nuclear energy is an important part of its energy portfolio. France is also investing in renewable energies like wind and sun. But um, the French people have a a much more favorable attitude towards nuclear energy. And um, I believe that the French way uh, is more in agreement with the uh, climate change uh, directives uh, because uh, the CO2 emission per year per capita in Germany is approximately nine tons. And in France, the CO2 emission is five tons. So I believe that the French climate policy is at least two times more successful than the German one. Um, you were also in Japan and China as a visiting, visiting professor. And the, the majority of the world's population lives in East and South Asia. And uh, if, if the climate policy, the, the, the fate of our climate is decided uh, somewhere on the planet, I think it's in Asia. Um, uh, is nuclear power a tool that they use to, uh, against uh, climate change? Absolutely. <clears throat> the reduction of the CO2 emission will be decided in China and in India. Because those countries are the biggest uh, countries in the world by population and China is the biggest CO2 emitter. And um, when visiting China, I uh, realized that the Chinese energy policy relies on a very broad portfolio of energy technologies. On the one hand, they invest in wind and sun. They have huge wind farms, huge solar power plants. They also invest in nuclear energy, including innovative reactor concepts like the molten salt concept. And they also invest in geothermal and in fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage, or at least with uh, use of CO2. So in my uh, observation, the Chinese energy policy um, in encompasses all the technologies that are consistently mentioned in the reports of the International Panel of Climate Change. So from this viewpoint, uh, China has a broader attitude, a, 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 a more holistic attitude to low carbon electricity than Germany. Let's use the remaining time to, to speak about energy storage and energy efficiency. Are they, what are the biggest uh, issues in European uh, energy policy regarding energy storage? Are there any good examples that we could follow? Uh, at the moment, um, we have the following options for storing electricity. I'm talking about electricity storage. Uh, for short times, you can use ordinary batteries. For very long time, you can use hydrogen. And for intermediate times, you can use a technology that we call Carnot batteries, that is converting electricity to heat and converting heat back to electricity. Um, in Germany, at the moment, uh, the sum of all the installed storage capacity is enough to power our country for about 45 minutes. 
So at the moment, we have a very limited storage capacity. If we want to increase the uh, fraction, the range, uh, the, the, the amount of renewables, we have to build energy storage capacities. And no matter which of the three technologies, batteries, hydrogen, or Carnot batteries, you want to build, this is not a technological problem, this is an economical problem. So I would wish that the technological development of the future would bring down the price of batteries, Carnot batteries and hydrogen to the level where we can roll them out in an amount of terawatt hours. And this is the amount that you need to compensate the fluctuation of wind and sun. Um, and, the, and the last question is, what is the question that we should talk about but nobody actually does? Uh, is there any topic that, that is completely not mentioned in the public debate? Uh, right now? I believe that in the German public debate, uh, most of the questions are mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> what I believe one question is not sufficiently discussed. Uh, this is to find the right balance between CO2 reduction on the one hand and adaptation to climate change on the other hand. Uh, I have the feeling that the discussion in the German public focuses very much on CO2 reduction, and it does not significantly sufficiently focus on measures that we can take in Germany in order to adapt to the climate change, to in, in, improve the technical uh, conditions, uh, to prevent flooding, uh, air conditioning of offices, and so on and so forth. So I believe that in future we will have to discuss more comprehensively the balance between CO2 reduction and adaptation to climate change. Dear Professor Tess, very, I'm very uh, glad that you have been uh, our guest at MCC Podcast. And I hope that uh, our audience enjoyed this talk as much as I did. Thank you very much. Thank you very much as well. Thank you for listening to this MCC Podcast episode. For further media content, please look up our English website at mcc.hu slash en or look for us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you want to read more by our professors, external contributors, and students, check out our knowledge base at korvinek.hu en.